Hey, I'm Mike Joseph, and thank you for listening to Detoxicity, a show by men, about men, but for everyone. I hope you enjoy the content of this podcast, and I want to let you know about a few things you can do to support us and our mission to challenge traditional notions of masculinity and create a more communicative, positive, and loving environment for all. You can subscribe to Detoxicity on any podcast platform that you use to listen. We are available just about everywhere. Also, don't hesitate to rate and comment as these help us move up in the podcast rankings. I'm on social media, or at least I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok as Detox Pod Guy. Feel free to drop me a follow. Now I have a Patreon page, yay! And uh, Patreon gives you the opportunity to get cool merch and exclusive episodes of this podcast in exchange for subscribing. Go to patreon.com slash detoxicitypod to find out more. Uh, finally, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, whether you found an episode of the podcast particularly enjoyable or enlightening, or you know someone who'd be a great guest, or you'd like to offer constructive criticism, or if you yourself would like to be on the podcast, hit me up. Reach out to me at one of the aforementioned social media channels, or if you're old school like I am, drop me an email, detoxpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and take care. Nabil Ayers is the president of Beggars Group, a family of independent record labels that was originally founded in the UK. He is based in Brooklyn. Uh, Nabil is also the author of My Life in the Sunshine, a mem- memoir he released last June in which he writes about his adventures as a working musician. Uh, his adventures as the co-founder of Sonic Boom Records in Seattle. Uh, Seattle is one of the greatest record store cities in the U.S., uh, so make sure you visit that place. And uh, his quest to discover more about his family tree. That's a great read. I highly recommend it. Nabil and I sat for a chat uh, while he was on the West Coast run for his book tour. Uh, A lot of what we discussed had to do with culture and identity, uh, but we also talked about entrepreneurship and the difficulty of managing people. Uh, We pondered the thin line between forgiveness and acceptance, and we talked about how how important representation is. I am, as usual, stumbling over my words today. It's not often I meet someone for the first time and immediately feel like this person is a friend, but Nabil has an easygoing vibe and radiates a level of positivity that made our chat really, really special. Hope you enjoy. So uh, everybody, please give a warm welcome to Nabil Ayers. My name is Nabil Ayers. I live in Brooklyn. I'm the president of Beggars Group, which is a company that sits over a bunch of incredible independent record labels. I used to play drums and bands, and now I'm an author, which sort of replaced that part of my life. I've realized the creative element, and I just published my memoir, My Life in the Sunshine, and I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. How does it feel to have your life on blast? I've wondered this about people who write memoirs. Your life is now public record yeah it's weird people have asked me that and of course i i think well the stuff that i wanted out there is what's public record of course it's not literally everything it's the story the way i got to choose to tell it but then the opposite side of that is i often think whatever i did put out there is absolutely fair game so for podcasts or interviews or or even like i'm still doing sort of book tour events and there's a different host every night or audience q a's and it's always people who are like is there anything you don't want to talk about and my answer is always thing in the book I will talk about because I've introduced it and it wouldn't be fair for me to be like, oh yeah, I just don't want to talk about like my dad. You can't really do that now that I've done this. So it's interesting. It feels good. I mean, I haven't had anything horrible happen. I've had tough questions and tough sure. situations, but nothing that I regret doing or saying yet two months in. Good. And that's sort of a seamless segue into my next question because while the book is about your relationship with your dad, it is not entirely about your relationship with your dad. And even aside from your dad, the whole meeting the rest of your family part, not to spoiler alert, folks, it is interesting as well. And a mutual friend of ours actually recommended the book to me. And I want to say the reason <clears throat> she recommended the book to me for two reasons. And I'm saying this without actually asking her why she recommended the book. One is that we are black men working in the music industry, not specifically in hip hop and R&B. Exactly. That's the real line, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is something I definitely want to explore further. And B, and I'm not sure how much Gina knows about this. I found my birth father last year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we now have a talk relationship and we've only had it for, this is August as we're recording this. So it's been 10 months. Wow. So I think that, that, 
Or your story is, yeah. yeah, obviously significantly different, but there's a little bit of parallel there. Yeah. Do you find that people who talk to you about the book, maybe more in like a, an interview context in a, a, a reader context, focus maybe a little bit too much on your relationship or lack of with your dad as opposed to everything else? Yeah, that's definitely become the, the, the number one thing. And of course, I named the book after it's a lyric from his song. It's kind of all the very short bio materials of the blurbs. That's kind of what it's about. This father who was never present in my life. But yeah, it's interesting. I think different people get different things. And when my, my wife's mother read it, she called me and she's like, wow, what an incredible book about your mother, which was the first person to say that to me. But that's because she was obviously reading from the perspective of a mother, I assume. Sure. But even though I'm, I'm not surprised, <laughs> largely surprised how much that's just like in short conversations, it's just like father, father, father. Yeah, yeah. I think people are going to look for the lowest hanging fruit. Right. And he's famous too. And much. he's famous. Exactly. Yeah. Now you grew up in New York City. Partially. I yeah. moved around a lot, but New York City, Amherst, Cambridge, and then eventually Salt Lake City. Which, yeah. and there's a lot of interestingness <laughs> in, in those things. I, I grew up here in Brooklyn. And oh, okay. I lived here through the 80s and 90s and part of the 2000s before I actually moved to Boston. Oh. So we've got some trajectory there too. Yeah. I always find it interesting when newcomers, and I've had a couple of conversations this week about people who are relatively new to New York, who've been here five years or less, talking about the quote unquote old days and people's <laughs> minds being blown what New York was. Yeah. And you talk about your uncle and who was a musician, mm -hmm. uh, still is a musician, I think. Yeah. yeah. And being in an area that was kind of an artist community then and is now a uh, rich people's community. Yeah. yeah. He lived on, on Canal Street and this is in the early seventies. I was born in 72. And I remember the mid seventies there quite well. And it was just like Canal Street on the West side. It just felt like the edge of the earth. It wasn't a scary neighborhood. I think I write about this. It wasn't dangerous. There's just nobody there. Those buildings were kind of empty. The, that nice park that's on the water was actually the high line. That was like an extension of that crappy freeway that was there to move grains in the thirties or something. It was a different city and you would just walk around there and not see anyone. There's one bar that you're in. Otherwise you had to walk to the village to get food. It was just desolate and, and really cool for that reason. Cause there are a lot of artists and musicians who live there and were doing cool stuff. Yeah. It's such a foreign concept now, 45 years later, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in light of significant changes that have been sort of nonstop throughout yeah. that time to think that a part of Manhattan in particular. I know. Was so That's what's crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it was already expensive. I don't think people ever thought New York was cheap, even though it sounds cheap now. So the fact that the C train was relatively close, it wasn't the middle of nowhere. It wasn't Red Hook. You could right. get there, but it just wasn't part of the city yet. Or actually it, it had been before. That's what's even more interesting than it stopped to be basically. It, yeah. It did one of those. Yeah. And then Tribeca came and <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Not being able to afford to live anywhere near Canal Street. Now. <laughs> you speak about your uncle very glowingly, and it seems like he was really the primary model of masculinity to you for a really long time. Uh, yeah. Talk about that, because it sounds like he deserves the flowers that you're giving him. Definitely. I mean, very much my father figure. He's my mother's younger brother. And the quick background is that my mother, when she was 20 met Roy Ayers, my father. My uncle's a musician, Alan, and they were at a jazz concert somewhere in New York. And Alan had met Roy a few times, kind of ended up talking and introduced my mother. And my mother at that moment said to herself, This is the man I'm going to have a child with, and not this is the man I want to marry or this is the man I want to be with. But she was, for some reason, really at a young age set on being a young single mother. And so they started, I mean, dating's not even the word, but I think hung out a few times. She eventually asked him, Will you? have a child with me. You don't have to be part of our lives. And he agreed. And I've always known that story. So of course there are issues, but it's not divorce. He didn't leave us. It's not this classic things. And my uncle, Alan was two years younger than my mother is an incredible jazz saxophone player. Um, he really early on was like, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. I'll be around. And he was, and still is. And he's definitely my father figure. He's the person that played music with me and bought me a drum set and did all the things a father should. And at least was partially responsible for instilling a love of music that signaled a path for your entire career. 
Right. I think so. Yeah. A lot of people ask me when I remember getting into music or questions like that. And I don't remember because there was never a time when I wasn't. It's like, do you remember your first bite of food or what <laughs> air was like the first time you breathed? It's like, no, of course not. It's just always been there. And I'm lucky in that way. And I think it's unique where it was just always around. My mother's a dancer. Alan plays saxophone. He would practice then. He was so serious. He went to Berkeley I and mean, he would practice three, four, five, six hours a day by himself. We lived in this loft on Canal Street with these incredible, really amazing musicians, some of which went on to do really well. And that's all it was. When I stayed at that apartment building, it was just music. And then sometimes they would eat or we would go take a walk or do something. And they have concerts on Friday nights. And my mother had a good record collection. They both did. So I listened to a lot of Beatles and Stevie Wonder and everything. So it was just always there. Wow. I wonder if there's an alternate universe in which you were not not into music growing up in that environment. It would be, I feel like, almost impossible. Right. And what would I have done? There's nothing else, literally. <laughs> there are no you, video games. There's no internet. I could have played, right. like, rub two sticks together or something. Like, what do you do in a place like that? <laughs> right, exactly. So I do want to talk about the, the Salt Lake portion, just because it's funny. The first person that I actually met that grew up in Utah was biracial. Oh, and wow. Yeah, I was like, there's another one. <laughs> there's, there's black people in Utah. That had to have been culture shock to the nth degree. It was, but it's weird. I mean, I've thought about this a lot and, and of course wrote about it. But yeah, my first 10 years were New York, Amherst, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I was such a normal kid in that we grew up around a lot of people. We were really poor, but everyone was poor. A lot of kids didn't have both parents, mostly missing fathers. That wasn't uncommon. Tons of biracial kids, especially in Amherst, tons of kids of different races. So me being the son of a young single mother with a black father who wasn't there wasn't weird at all. So for 10 years, I totally fit in. And there's nothing that ever even made me think, oh, I'm different because I wasn't. And so I think that was a really important base to have going into the rest of my life because then we moved to Salt Lake City <laughs> when I was 10 years old. My mother worked for American Express and she's not a corporate person. She went, got her MBA and got this power job at American Express because she had a kid and needed to get us ahead in life. And it was amazing that she did that, but it's not who she is and it's not what she wanted to do. So there's this weird opportunity to move there. And I think they were kind of told, New York's crazy. Salt Lake is chill. Work is nine to five. Everyone there has lots of kids. It's not the intense work thing you're used to in New York. It's cheap. It's beautiful. There's the outdoors, all these things. So we got convinced to move there. And my second biggest fear was the race thing. Like, am I going to be the weird kid for the first time? That wasn't my number one fear. My number one was what about music? Mm. I live in New York. This is my life. I get to see concerts. I've got my uncle. I know people in bands. It was all right there. And what surprised me more than anything was that that actually got better in Salt Lake. And I think it's because there are so many kids in Salt Lake, because the Mormons have a lot of children, <laughs> typically, every show there was all ages. In New York, things were often 21 and over, unless it was a huge band. Things were expensive. Things sold out. It just didn't have the same access. And suddenly in Salt Lake, way more people played there than I thought would, maybe because it's between Denver and Seattle or Denver and L.A., but especially once I was in high school, I got to see Jane's Addiction and Living Color and Fishbone and these incredible bands and what felt like the beginning of their career in, like, small punk clubs. And I don't know that I would have been able to do that in New York. And so in a weird way, it was more musical <laughs> for me, right. I think. That, in my head, makes total sense. We talked a little bit on, on Twitter about Living Color and Fishbone in particular. I would imagine having a young Corey Glover <sighs> in your face would have just been a tremendous experience. Yeah, that, that's what was crazy. On the race tip, this is all related, obviously. It was weird, but Salt Lake... I lived there for seven years and I spend a lot of time defending it, but it wasn't racist in the way that people think about. And this is just my thing, but I think it's because it was so white that it actually wasn't even a threat. There weren't black people robbing stores or whatever stereotypical movie things weren't really even happening there. There was crime, but it wasn't that. And I also think people couldn't tell that I was black. A lot of white people can't tell. I have a black father and a white mother. I have a Middle Eastern name. So that also comes into place. So I didn't get called names or like excluded. I just got like, where are you from? What are you? Can I touch your Afro? Are you poor? I got a lot of that, <laughs> which sucked and was right. weird to have it for the first time ever after these incredible 10 years of feeling so included. And so to suddenly have people ask me these questions, it was like, what? Well, I've never 
had to answer these. And I would just say, my parents are divorced to get rid of it quickly. And then, of course, got into MTV, which was all white rock music. But then saw Fishbone and saw Living Color. And I was this rock kid who, who really, in a way, didn't feel like I could do that because I would watch these videos and see these dudes with blonde hair and be like, well, that's amazing. I want to do that, but I don't think I'm allowed to or... I don't think there's space for me or whatever it was. And seeing those shows, there was one moment that was a really weird one where the Living Color show, there's this place called the Speedway Cafe in Salt Lake. And this is on the Vivid Tour, their first album, 300 people, super packed. And the most black people I've ever seen at anything in Salt Lake. <laughs> it was crazy. And right before the band went on, a tech, the guitar tech or a roadie or whatever, came out first on the stage and picked up Vernon Reed's guitar and just played this blistering 10 second sound check crazy thing <laughs> and the whole room applauded and went crazy and that in a weird way was even more of a moment than living color for me because i knew what was going on it's like oh they're everywhere there's fishbone there's living color there's also this guy whoever he is he can go up there and be a, a rock star it's totally possible i remember that moment really well that this roadie in a weird way made it even seem more possible that's an interesting take i i i'm not a musician but I remember I was 12 when Vivid came out and didn't have the presence of mind to realize that Slash at that time was black. I don't know that he was particularly right. got his identity at that right, time. Right, right, yeah. And the closest thing that we had really had to a black rock musician, a contemporary black rock musician at that point was Prince. Right, right. But to see Living Color and Fishbone and then eventually Bad Brains and all of these other bands, I was somebody who, like, I loved hip hop and I love R&B, but I was also listening to Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and yeah. like, not even hard rock. I was listening to like, Crowded House and bands like that. <laughs> right. And bands that you wouldn't normally think would have a black audience yeah. and feeling excluded. Because it was like, okay, not only am I getting shit from my friends because I like this kind of music, <laughs> but I don't know anybody that looks like me that plays this music. So seeing that Cult of Personality video for the first time, yeah. seeing Sunless Saturday or seeing any of those videos, it was just like, oh, shit, this is <laughs> real. Yeah. And that sort of representation is so important. And I think in 2022, it's, A, significantly easier to access. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. And, that, that's yeah. a big part of it, right? Then we had to find out about it through one of the very few channels. Yeah. And now it's a bit more commonplace. And look, even now, you, there are still people who go on social media and they're like, well, this is white music, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but there's also a thousand people that will shout that person down. Right. Where that didn't exist before. I, mm -hmm. and you had the same questions that I think a lot of black and brown people have when they are listening to music that they may have created but society right. has determined is not music for them quote unquote yeah and the, at least the weird thing about salt lake is that like i'd go to the tears for fears show and i wouldn't think like where are all the black people because there's none of them to be there anywhere i saw tony williams incredible jazz drummer at a small jazz club in salt lake and even that was all white people it's a white town or it certainly was even more white then so in a weird way it wasn't a surprise i knew what the audience was going to look like everywhere all the time right right yeah and i guess moving to the next step one thing that I kind of this steals deal of approval for Nabil Ayers with me <laughs> was he worked at Easy Street, which is one of my favorite record stores in the entire world. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Matt, who I think kind of knows me and kind of doesn't. Oh, amazing. Uh, Easy Street is an amazing shop. Anybody who visits Seattle, please go. But Sonic Boom, you, I guess, co-founded. Yeah, in 97, we both worked at Easy Street, my friend Jason and I, and then we decided to open our own store and we opened Sonic Boom, which is now a proper store, but at the time was just a closet, like a teeny little store on the main floor of a house that grew and then shrunk a little bit. We sold it in 2016, but it's turning 25 in September, which is so crazy. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what was your mindset going into opening a business? What gave you the <laughs> impetus to be like, what? I'm going to open a record store. Of course, we were lucky, but Seattle at the time was pretty cheap. Jason and I both lived in houses that were, what, with roommates, like $300 a month. We worked at a record store making probably $8 an hour. So it's not like we had a lot of disposable income, but we worked in record stores, which meant everything we wanted. There's so many free drinks, things and free dinners, the labels, and of course, records and shows. So that's what we would have spent our money on. 
So we were fine and we both were working these record store jobs because they were fun and we just wanted to be in music and that I wanted to play in bands. He was in radio. That was the obvious place to work to just be connected to all of such a community in the town. And I, I feel bad telling the story, but it's kind of true. I mean, I love Matt Vaughn. He's still a good friend. I treated that job very much like I'm going to be great at this job during the exact moments that I'm here to do this job. I was like a clerk, but I also, I was the label person. So I would talk to the labels and deal with guest list, list for tickets and make sure poster displays are up and do the charts and those kind of things. And I got a 30 minute break for lunch or whatever. And the second it started, I was at the desk booking shows for my band or trying to do something for my own thing. And Jason, on the other hand, worked really hard and would like, stay overtime and reorganize records and like, go the extra mile for the store, which was of course incredible. But once he kind of asked me, I do so much more than you do, but Matt seems to like you more. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, what's up with that? And I explained, I was like, look, I love this job and I take it seriously. I do everything I'm supposed to and I do it well, but every second of personal time is exactly that. I want to further that as putting out singles by bands and things like that. And I just kind of thought for a second and he said, we should open a record store. And this is a different time. I mean, in 1997, we just went to a bar, drew out the budget on a napkin. And we knew there was one neighborhood, Fremont in Seattle at the time that was kind of like a bohemian, but was becoming a little fancier and a little cooler right then. There wasn't a record store there because Seattle had a lot of record stores. They're like, we don't want to open next door to someone else, but Fremont seems perfect. Let's see if we can find a space. Found this great main floor of a house, the small space. It was $1,500 a month. And so we're like, if we do that, we got to spend money on records. We got to buy bins. There'll be a couple other expenses. We just seriously drew it out. This wasn't on Excel or anything. We didn't have a computer. Right. We broke it down on paper to like... Okay, that means we need to make X dollars a month, which is this many records a month, which is this many records a week. And we eventually broke it down to where it was like, okay, we need to sell two new CDs, one used CD, a seven inch per hour. We seriously broke it down to that. And when we looked at that, we were like, we could do that. And that is what prompted us <laughs> to do it. We just broke it down to a point where it just looked possible financially. It cost $30,000. We got a loan from Jason's mom and put the rest on our credit cards. And the first two and a half years were brutal. I mean, we would split lunches and have hours when no one came in the store. But then eventually it started to grow just from word of mouth. And we moved into a much bigger, more expensive space. And then it just changed like overnight. Pre-social media. That's, that's how you did things. <laughs> Pre-social media. If you are <laughs> under 30, you are probably listening to this like, what? <laughs> yeah, there was no tweeting to be done. <laughs> right? Amazing. What is the most important lesson you learned from being a business owner? Oh, man. What was cool about doing that is we were both 25. So weirdly, it was our first real job. I guess, obviously, we worked for a record store. Then we opened our own record store. But we were kids. A lot of people have a real job. And then finally, you get a big investor. You do something and you go out on your own. But this was kind of the opposite. Our expenses were so low. If the store had gone out of business overnight, we would have been fine. We would have been on the hook for the credit card bill. But it wasn't going to ruin our lives. We'd done whatever is next. And that almost happened many times. But it didn't. Those first few years were so hard. And we complained so much that how come no one's coming in? We might can't afford rent. And then once we moved and it grew and we started hiring employees and then opening more locations for a while, we had three and 23 employees. <laughs> what I learned is by far the hardest thing about running a business is managing people. Mm. I mean, there our employees were great. Even if you have great employees, it's just hard. People want things, people need things, and they don't always align with exactly what you're trying to do, which is just sell some fucking records. <laughs> it's never that simple. And it, it's not anyone's fault, but that's just how it is. Pe people take a lot of time and energy. And look, everyone wants to have people who come in, do their job, do above and beyond for their job. But when you hire somebody, you're hiring the entire person. And right. That is their baggage, their neuroses, their tics, their totally in the bed. Yeah. Right. Whatever it is, the best employee in the world might forget to set the alarm one night. And yeah, it was just constantly dealing with it. We we're so lucky. We always hired really great people who worked at the store. That's just that like, even really great people take a lot of energy. They That's just do. Right. That's right. And I did record stores actually for 10 years. And oh, wow. Was the start of my, my career in New York. Yeah. What stores? I did Tower for three. Oh, wow. Which one? Yeah, I did two stores. I did the Lincoln Center store. Oh, wow. And there was briefly one on the Upper East Side, but it was on third between 86 and 87. Whoa. A lot yeah. of classical? We had a very heavy classical business, but we also had a lot of the Dalton kids. Oh, yeah. Right. Of course. 
So I remember Doggy Style came out during that period. <laughs> and my shift was 3.30 to 12.30. And I came in and it was already sold out. And I was like, hey, all of these rich white kids love hip hop music. You can't underestimate this. That was a funny thing and every an easy street realization that it was like Are, it's all white kids buying this. Yeah, shit. absolutely. So I have a lot of respect for people who are able to work retail because the same way you say hiring people and managing people is difficult, essentially being a public servant is something that will take a toll on you over time. Yeah. It's truly the front lines. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you have stories. Yeah. Lots of good ones too and, and terrible ones. Yeah. But you transitioned out of working in a record store to then to do the corporate thing. Yeah, um, I, guess, I guess it's the corporate thing. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 corporate music industry is much different than corporate other stuff. Yeah. And the corporation I work for happens to be owned by someone who started in a record store, which I right. think says a lot just to the culture. And there's so many people at Beggars who come from record stores. And it's definitely a common thread, young and old. Right on. I wonder, when you go to work now, are people looking at you different? Like, I know this guy's life story. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't notice anyone looking at me different. I mean, some people at work have said, I read your book. I really enjoyed it which is nice. It's like, what do you say? It's so weird about work. It's like, when you, I mean, you and I don't know this anymore, but when you used to show up somewhere and someone's like, oh, you got your hair cut. And <laughs> now you, so because you brought it up, you kind of have to say it looks good. So it's always weird when someone's like, I spent hours of my life reading the 320 pages you wrote. Right. Period. <laughs> and it's like, they're supposed to say something. But it's awkward because I, I certainly don't expect anyone to read it. And if someone wants to, Great. But yeah, I don't think about it much. It doesn't come up much at work. I mean, I try to not tweet during work hours <laughs> for that right reason on. sometimes. Right on. But I mean, but everyone tweets during work hours. Yes. So. Yes, they do. So going into the family stuff, uh, mm -hmm. which I just find incredibly intriguing and interesting, you have done a lot of legwork to connect some dots. And where do you find the stamina, the strength? Because that's a lot of work. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's something that comes from my mother and my mother's side of the family. I knew my grandmother really well. She died when I was like 30 or something like that. And my mother's still alive. I talk to her all the time. She lives in Brooklyn. We're close. Both of those women have always been super into family and connection. And my grandfather had several siblings, so there's tons of cousins. And I remember my grandmother talking about them and the really old pictures have all these people that I just, that's cousin Billy and that's this cousin, all those things. And my mother's been really good at that to the point where still to this day, we'll be like, I found a new cousin. And there's this woman, Jamie, who's amazing. She lives in Newport, California. She came to my book event, and now we're going to have lunch next week when I'm there. It's really cool. So that's always existed on my mother's side of the family, and my father's side has been the opposite. I've never known him, never known anything about his family except really rudimentary stuff that he grew up in L.A. and had three sisters, but never knew anything else. And so once I started to kind of get a sort of taste of it and started to get some nuggets or started to realize, oh, there's stuff to explore here. And now I'm connected to it, which the quick version is I did 23andMe. That led to someone giving me a family tree. I started doing research on my own and found interesting connections that way. It was just like, oh, wow, this exists. It did take a ton of energy and a ton of tenacity and a ton of, let me try to turn over this stone. Oh, not that one. Let me just email this person and see if they know anything. And of course, there's a lot in the book, but what's not in the book is all the dead ends, because that's not <laughs> fun to read about. But of right. course, there are lots of those too. So I, I think I think it comes to me from my mother's side, and it's now going up to discovering. I mean, really, the way I describe it is my father's there. He's alive and well and touring the world. We just don't know each other, and he hasn't given me any access. So I've figured out a way to just go around him and do all of this stuff and learn all of it. I think I probably know more than he does at this point. Probably. I, and, and when you are doing all of this research and hitting those dead ends, and I'm sure in addition to the joy you feel connecting the dots and connecting with these people, there's also disappointment in connections maybe not going the way that you would want them to go or some connections not being made at all. How right. do you manage the, the triumph with the disappointment? What keeps you moving forward? 
it's like a life metaphor that I think about sometimes, which is a work thing. It's a personal thing. It's definitely relates to what you're asking about with this family thing is like, as long as there's something positive and something good happening that I can focus on, it can take my attention away from the negative thing that's happening. And maybe that is what sparks the tenacity or the endurance or the stamina or whatever is that I can't just have something go wrong and then stop because then that's it. But if I have something go wrong and I have something else happening over here that's maybe promising or is going well, that sort of becomes the narrative. That's amazing. Wonder Where did that outlook come from? <sighs> I don't know. If I think about that, I mean, no one's ever sort of explained that to me. And I mean, my mother's very positive, but not in that way. I'm guessing it might be something that comes down from my father, but I don't know. I certainly know he's ambitious without knowing him. It's visible. It's very right. easy to see how much he works, how hard he works, how many albums he has. The fact that he's 81 and he's touring Still England touring. right now. Yeah. So all of that, I feel like I got some of that from him. And the title, My Life in the Sunshine, is obviously taken from my father's song. But to me, it's such a super optimistic phrase because it's not just a lyric from his song. I'm, my book is about my great life. And that's more what that title represents to me than, oh yeah, it's just a lyric, but really has a deeper meaning than that. And so I get the feeling he has a lot of optimism and positivity. That's important to have in this world as a black man in this world, certainly, because I do think that a lot of forces conspire to beat you down. But I'm impressed by the fact that you have overturned all of these stones and there's a great passage at the end of your book, and I'm not going to blow it up and be super <laughs> specific about it, but finding this whole other family combination of like blood relatives and even some found family mixed in there, right. chosen family as well. It feels so wholesome, but, <laughs> 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 but, it, but it also feels super triumphant. Like, hey, I was able to take what a lot of people would say is a negative, which is not having a relationship with your dad, mm. uh, growing up in what is not a traditional nuclear family and having this beautiful life that isn't a storybook, but still has a positive uh, a vibe to it. I, it's incredibly inspiring. And I think that attitude has just got to come from somewhere. Yeah, right? I mean, a lot of that is my uncle and my mother, especially my uncle, so spiritual and positive and always kind of sees the the upside, there's a part in the book where when I finally meet my father as an adult, and we have this great lunch and everything's cool. And he tells me that he's proud of me. And at the time, I remember thinking like, hmm, I'm not sure how I feel about that statement. It's going to take me time to think about that and process it. Because that's not something you say to someone in our situation. Or you should say you're proud of yourself for having someone you feel proud of. Or proud of my mother. Or proud of my uncle. Proud of anyone. That's what I was thinking. But I told my uncle that. And my uncle's like... He's just trying to give you a compliment. <laughs> it's like, oh, right. You can always bring it down and chill and figure out the positive side. <laughs> I love people like that who can get inside your head and pull the one sentence out and distill it. Yep. He can do that. He always sees, sees the good in everyone and everything. From a racial perspective, what have you learned from getting more in touch with the black side of your family? I always have this kind of fear that they're not going to fully accept me because I'm not, whatever, not as black as they are, whatever that means. <laughs> I mean, whatever yes, that means. Yeah. Exactly. But that's just in my head sometimes. I mean, I have a white mother and they, they do not. So we've talked about it. That's in the book too. But there's a part where my cousin says to me at the table full of these brand new cousins and everyone who are being so cool and who I still talk to and see, she says, do you identify as black? And I was like, oh shit, this is it. This is the moment. This is the test. What do I say? Do I make something up? How do I not get kicked out of this room? Like all this stuff is going through my head, but I just told the truth, which was don't, but I definitely don't identify as white. And I kind of got into the story of growing up in Amherst in these places where like, it just wasn't important to belong to or claim a race. And it's a unique thing that a lot of people, especially in America, don't understand that for 10 years, it didn't matter. No one cared what race I was. No one asked. I didn't care what races my friends were, and I didn't ask. It just wasn't a thing. It was such an interesting mix. And of course, parents made foods and talked about their Cuban heritage. It didn't not exist in that way. It just didn't exist in a way that I needed to have a label and hang out with the kids who are like me. 
which I think is what most people's childhood, especially mm -hmm. people of color, I think white people don't have to think about that. Non-white people often have to choose a group based on what they look like. And I, I never had to do that. I never even could have done that if I had a chance in Salt Lake. Cause you I, know, <laughs> yeah. I, that's probably an, an important distinction to make is that even if you had right. to choose a black lunch table, there wasn't a black lunch table to choose. Right. And that was the other weird thing about Salt Lake. Again, this is just my recollection and my story, but I hung out with mostly white kids, but not completely, but it didn't feel like, oh yeah, there are the 10 black kids over there, but I'm not hanging out with them. I'm choosing this. It was just because there were so few people of color, the people of color just hung out with everyone. That's an interesting perspective. And I'm trying to relate that back to kind of my own experience. And I grew up in places where there wasn't a large black population. Yeah. Um, where in Brooklyn did you grow up? East Flatbush. So I, yeah. my junior high school was all black, except for one kid who was a custodian's child. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Got that kid on the podcast. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and I went to Brooklyn Tech, which was a very integrated high school. But I think Vernon Reed went to Brooklyn yeah, Tech. Vernon, Vernon Reed, a tons of people. I, it is Lou Ferrigno. They would one of our most <laughs> famous really? alumni, Lou That's Ferrigno, awesome. but it was mostly minority. And even the white people, they were ethnic white people. They weren't waspy. So it was still a very heavy minority environment. Right. Um, still New York. Yeah. yeah. So until I moved to Boston, I had never really been in extremely white spaces. Yeah. As an adult, I've only come and gone playing in bands or for work or whatever, but it always feels just really chopped up and divided and to me like unhealthy and scary it is, <laughs> for it, lack of a better term <laughs> it's segregated man the last couple of years i lived in watertown which is like 93 percent white wow and boston is one of those places in my experience that's not blatantly racist no one's going to call you the n-word to your face mm -hmm. but it is very provincial and if they know that you ain't from here it's like right into so a like... bar and, and the record skips <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's interesting to hear it through your experience. The racial identification you felt or didn't feel growing up right. uh, versus also now having this family dynamic, which is more diverse or, or not what you were experiencing as a youngster. Yeah. In terms of I'm your the, immediate family. I think about the Salt Lake thing all the time. And on one hand, I think wow, what an incredibly lucky experience that I was able to move from these diverse places to this very white place and really fit in. I was in bands and went to proms and I had a very normal, fun high school experience. I went to the parties. I loved it. I miss it even. <laughs> and I was definitely able to fit in. Recently, it's been so fun because so many people from different parts of my life have gotten in touch since this book's come out and I've got an email or whatever message from this kid who's exactly my age, <laughs> who, who I wasn't good friends with, but who I remember. And we went and got coffee in New York a couple of weeks ago. And it was fascinating. He'd read the book. He is Korean. And he had, it sounds like a harder experience than I did, meaning like, he's like, I remember getting called names. But a lot of the stuff that I talk about in the book too, I had a white girlfriend. I always wondered when her dad was going to be like, okay, how long you been dating that guy? Like the same things where a lot of it's just like, Nothing happened there, but me and him both had to go through the energy and sort of pain, for lack of a better term, of constantly thinking about mm -hmm. that and wondering when the shoe was going to drop, which in some ways is almost harder than someone saying something. But it's like every time I went to a prom or a date in high school, I seriously got so scared and nervous when I was showing up at the girl's house because she was always white because that's what people were. <laughs> and, and she'd said yes, it was all set up, but still I felt like I was going to show up and some dad or some little brother, someone would say something. It seemed so likely to me. Well, Never happened. Out. But the amount of energy I spent those 20 times just getting ready for it, I wish like that would have been nice to not have to deal with. And maybe I didn't need to. Maybe I should have just been myself and never worried about it. I'll never know. You'll never know. Does that translate now as a, going back to something we talked about at the beginning, as a music industry executive who is a black music industry executive who is not solely a hip-hop and r&b based executive do you yeah i mean not solely really right. just not yeah, not at all <laughs> i mean i'm a rock guy yeah, yeah. that's that reverse thing where sometimes people are like ask nabil he knows hip-hop like what right, are you like, talking right, yeah, about exactly. you want to talk about kiss or def leppard i can do that <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it is interesting i mean 
I work in a pretty white indie world, meaning like this 4AD who I worked for 13 years, Pixies and Cocteau Twins and Deer Hunter and some of the most incredible greatest artists of all time, but largely but not completely white artists. But recently, I've certainly started working with way more artists of color. And before George Floyd, I'm happy and proud to say that it wasn't a reaction. But it's less of a work thing for me. It is fun to know that the Barty Stranges of the world, and I have the pleasure of working with him, but just that he exists and he's doing what he does, let alone the fact that I got to work with him. That's incredible. But even if he would signed with a different label, I think I would be just as excited. Just the fact that this world is more open to that. Because musically, it makes tons of sense, but it's so exciting to have somebody telling a different story in the space. Yeah, I think that we have been pigeonholed Right. for so long. And I have lots of conversations about the evils of social media versus the positives of social media. <laughs> right. And one is that it sort of democratized a lot of cultural stereotypes. Like, oh, wow, there is room for the, the Black person who likes alternative rock. <laughs> Um, right. And it's not something new. There were black folks who liked Pink Floyd. There were black folks who liked Kiss. But I feel like the dominant narrative then, and still to an extent now, is that if someone looks like me or you, you don't <laughs> ask them about Kiss. Right. That's true. Yeah. And Kiss, weirdly for me as a kid, was a huge gateway. I mean, I was five when I bought Destroyer. Love that album. Still do. But obviously still hear it through kid ears and, and think they're incredible. But what worked for me is that we listen to so much different music, especially because my uncle is in the jazz. We're listening to Sun Ra and John Coltrane and the Beatles and Helen Reddy. A lot of black artists, a lot of white artists, a lot of male, a lot of female. But to the story earlier about Living Color, I'd look at those records and be like, well, that's not me. Those Beatles, that, that's definitely not me. And also Stevie Wonder, that's not me. Look how much darker his skin is. Look how tight that afro is. Mine was like this total lumpy, hippie. 70s afro that like just looked like i slept on the street or something <laughs> so i was like i'm literally between these people i don't see me on any of these records and weirdly <laughs> it makes sense to me now but kiss was the band i could identify with because i could look like them i knew they were white you could see their hands and i knew their names and my mother was excited because paul and jean are jewish and she always talked about that <laughs> but it didn't matter it was that they were in costume and that when I dressed up like them, I could look like them. And that was the idea that I might not be Stevie Wonder. I might not be John Lennon, but I could be Peter Chris. If I put all this shit on, I look more like him than either of those guys. And so right. they were the weird, like, maybe I can do this band first. Someone is going to have to do a study. And I'd actually be very surprised if this has not been done already about Kiss and their stranglehold on <laughs> children of a certain oh, age. I that mean, grew seriously. Up in a certain time. Yeah. A lot of people just don't get it, and that's fine. I understand why they wouldn't get it, but the people who get it, I mean, they just got us by the throat. <laughs> it was all the imagery and the explosions and the music, too, but it just worked. They figured it out, and it was incredible. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. I, I, <laughs> I'm sure he's done a paper on that at some point. I am pretty positive. I've spent hours and hours writing a thesis on Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what's the next step? What, the book is out. You have made these huge inroads into knowing elements of your family that you were not aware of before. I would assume even as you're touring behind the book, there's got to be at least one or two people who have popped up and been like, well, Nabil, by the way, uh, oh, I'm related yeah. to so-and-so on so-and-so <laughs> side. One or two is putting it lightly. Yeah, really? I mean, yeah, I was surprised. So what happened is I'd been preparing for this. And when the book's coming out, it's a book, so it's going to take time to get out there. And in a way, it's still early. It's been out for two months. But I thought, well, this will start making its way to people. People will tell other people about it. And I'll start hearing from maybe even new family members or people who just have some connection to my father or my mother or anything. But I hope that that happens because a lot of it is about this discovery and this excitement at meeting new people. But what happened is I... I was the subject of the CBS Saturday morning piece, which is this seven minute, pretty intense segment that tells the whole story and there's an interview and the host asks me, what do you want to say to your father if he's watching? And that was great. And that aired June 4th, three days before the book came out. And so what was wild was that in my head, it was only three days, but in my heart and my gut, I wasn't ready for all of it to get out there that quickly. And that spread mm. so fast on social media. The video was watchable. So instantly on June 4th, anyone in the world who had any connection to Roy or any of this stuff, it was everywhere. So starting that day, I just started getting DMs via all my channels from like, I'm 
I'm the singer on Everybody Loves the Sunshine. Let's get on the phone. I'm your dad's lawyer from the 70s. Let's get on the phone. But what was interesting was all these people said, let's get on the phone. And I, with all of them, was like, absolutely. And had would call all of these people. I'm still calling them. A lot of them are based in LA and I'll be there next week. And so I'm like going to have meetings. The calendar's full. I mean, one woman is like, I was good friends with your grandmother. Wow. I mean, really crazy stuff. This woman who showed up at the LA events with, with records in her hand and all these pictures. And she's like, I was your father's first manager. I signed into Polydor in 1970. Like, whoa, there are tons of people coming out and it's fascinating and it's really cool. And so I don't know what the next step is. I think the next step is like, keep doing it. Keep talking to people. I'm writing about all of it and I'm keeping track of all of it. If for no other reason, then I just don't want to forget it. I don't necessarily want to write a sequel unless it really feels natural, but I am sort of documenting it just from a, like, it should exist right. point of view, but I don't know. I want to write <laughs> a fiction book. I keep telling people this now, really so maybe it has to happen. My favorite movies are these thrillers, but not Robert Altman, David and Mamet movies, like House of Games and The Spanish Prisoner, these weird offbeat thrillers that are like, someone always dies and there's lots of weird twists and they're sort of brainy and nerdy. I want to write an indie rock or a rock thriller about a band on tour where there's violence and death and of course some racism <laughs> and stuff like that and i don't think it takes place now maybe it's in the 70s or in some different time for some reason when i think about that and talk about that that sounds really fun and when i talk about the other thing it's like well i have to do that obviously but it doesn't excite me mm. and maybe it will as it continues but in my head right now i really want to just make up a long ass story and see what happens i have no idea if i can do that <laughs> I I certainly encourage that. That sounds like a a book that I would read. <laughs> <laughs> Could be fun. We'll see. And, and then you do the film adaptation, and you win a couple of Oscars, and I'll be right, like, right. I interviewed the Bill yeah. Ayers, and Jordan Peele gets a hold of it. Exactly. What has been the biggest change in yourself since the book was completed and released? I think it's a pretty easy one. It's just I have no problem talking about all this stuff, and that happened overnight. For 50 years, whenever my father came up, I felt so awkward. And I would almost, I think, deliberately put across this leave me alone vibe. You can even curse. I know I what you were about to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> leave me the fuck alone. Yes. There you go. Let it out. <laughs> and this is really funny. I was at a work dinner a few years ago, or, well, a couple months ago, and this woman came up to me. She's like, we met five years ago at this music festival in Canada. I was like, oh yeah, I remember meeting you. Yeah. How's it going? And she's like, I'm really excited to read your book. I see it's coming out. I'm surprised you wrote it because when we met, whatever, five years ago, I remember saying, is Warrior is your father? And she said it with a French accent. She's like, and you became really cold and distant. Hey. <laughs> it's like, oh wow. I don't remember that, but I absolutely believe you. And I think what changes writing it and putting it out there and I think that's part of the reason I did it. It's been hard to always brace myself for those conversations or when I hear his song or when someone asks me if I'm related or they ask me if I'm going to see him when he's playing next week to always have to explain it and feel uncomfortable explaining it. So I think in a way, just literally putting it all out there makes it so much easier to talk about and partially because I won't need to talk about it because people will know more without asking me. <laughs> and part of it is just because... I've talked about it and now I'm just better at talking about it. It's fine. So I think that's the huge change. It's just like, it's fine to talk about. Letting that go kind of frees you. Mm -hmm. I think I talk about it a bit in the book, but it empowers me when I was trying to reach out to him or trying to meet up with my father, all these things, it was always in his hands. He got to make the decision. He got to decide to call me back or not, or to meet me or not. And I felt really powerless in that. And I don't like that. And so it has allowed me to stop relying on that and just do what I want and find out things without him helping. It's totally fine. It's great. And this will be my last question. Forgiveness is something that gets talked about a lot. And I, I bring up a lot on this show. Do you feel like you even really needed to forgive? And if so, where are you in that process? Yeah, I've thought about that and was careful to not really, I don't think I ever used that word in the book. It's not, he didn't do anything wrong, certainly, but on paper, everyone did exactly what they agreed. He said, I'll be your father and I won't be around. And that's what he did. So of course people have issues with this, but I never expected anything more from him. It got harder, of course, once I tried to get more from him, but I don't know. It's not about forgiveness. I think acceptance is more the word. And that's kind of 
where the book ends, which is me just saying, I can only do so much to try to connect with him. And I can do a lot to try to connect with other people without him. And I need to accept that he's not part of my life. He's not going to get back to me and it's okay. And I'm happy for all the great things he's contributed and the end smiley face. <laughs> sunshine sunshine emoji there you go i love it i love it man oh this this is a good conversation while nabil's story is very different than mine uh it's easy to see some similarities as well and uh, think about how things that he discussed have played out in my own life whether it's about representation being the only black person or one of few black people in majority white spaces or whether it's trying to figure out my family tree which is something that i'm still working on or whether it's writing a memoir which is something that i've also considered for a really really long time and don't know the first thing about getting started on at any rate nabil is a very special person i thank him for appearing on this podcast uh, you can find him on pretty much every social media platform in existence under his neighbor under his real name nabil airs and uh, his memoir, My Life in the Sunshine, is out now. Make sure you check it out. It is a fantastic read. Super shout out to Gina Williams for letting me know about the book. And uh, big shout out to Nabil once again for taking the time out of his schedule. And uh, it's a pretty busy schedule to sit down and have a chat. I'm hoping that we can resume that once you're back in Brooklyn. Thank you for listening to Detoxicity. I hope you found this particular episode interesting. And if you are new, I hope you go back and listen to all of the older episodes. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Joseph. I am the host and producer of this show. And uh, there are a lot of things that you can do to continue to support our mission, continue to support this podcast. Uh, follow me on social media. I am on Instagram, Twitter, and I'm on TikTok as Detox Pod Guy. Uh, you can also send me an email if you'd like. I'm at detoxpod at gmail.com. I am always on the hunt for people with interesting, inspirational, and powerful stories. So if you know somebody who fits that bill or if you yourself fit that bill, please don't hesitate to drop me a line via email or via social media. Uh, please make sure you subscribe on your podcast platform that you're listening to this on. Uh, rate, comment, help a brother out, uh, help us move up in the rankings. Uh, follow me on social media, like I said. Uh, follow our Patreon or subscribe to my Patreon, actually. Patreon.com slash detoxicity pod you get access to exclusive episodes you get episodes a little earlier than the general public you get a cool ass sticker lots of stuff once again patreon.com slash detoxicity pod quick shout out to calvin williams for providing the music and uh doing his magic on the logo which was originally designed by jacob block i thank you all for listening i wish you all the best please take care of each other till next time peace <laughs>